I've been asked a few times about the problem of the elastic pendulum, which is fundamentally a simple pendulum that's oscillating on a spring. Here we have a pendulum with mass m attached to a linear spring of stiffness k. Gravity is present in this problem. So we start off by adding some coordinate systems. Uh, we'll say the y direction is upward. We'll draw a little unit vector. Put in the r direction and the theta direction. So r is the radial direction and theta is the tangential direction. And the length of this pendulum, which is variable, is equal to L. L is a function of time, equal to L0 plus x. Okay, so at any given time, it's an initial length L0 plus x, which is the stretch in the spring, and that is the length of the pendulum. It's a two degree of freedom system, and our coordinates will be theta, and then also x, which is the displacement in the radial direction. And this is a very interesting problem because it's a combination of two previous problems that we've seen. One is the simple harmonic oscillator with the mass vibrating on a spring. And the other is the simple pendulum with a mass just swinging on a rod. So we'll use the method of Lagrange's equations to find the equations of motion. And the first thing we need to do then is find the kinetic energy of the system. The kinetic energy T is equal to 1 half mv squared. Um, the velocity in this case is a vector since it has two components, one in the r direction due to the spring displacement and the other in the theta direction due to the, the rocking or swaying of the pendulum. So it's a vector squ squared. And that can be rewritten as one half mass times velocity squared in the r direction plus the velocity squared in the theta direction. Remember, because it's a vector, we just square each component of the vector. And that can be rewritten as m over 2 times the velocity in the r direction is x dot squared, and the velocity in the tangential in the theta direction is l theta dot squared. And we can rewrite that as t is equal to m over 2 times x dot squared plus and then since L, we have a formula for it, that's L0 plus X of T. We can say L0 plus X of T squared, theta dot squared, and that is equation one. Let's put a box around it. Okay, next we move on to finding the potential energy. Potential energy V has two components. One is due to the gravitational potential energy of the pendulum, which is just MGH, plus due to the spring, one half KX squared. We can rewrite that as V equals mg times, and then h is L cosine theta, but L in this case is L0 plus x, so it's L0 plus x cosine theta, and that's in the negative direction because it's downwards, plus 1 half kx squared. Call that equation number 2 and put a box around that. Now we can find the Lagrangian, which is very simply just T minus V. And that is equal to 1 half mx dot squared plus 1 half, one half ml0 plus x quantity squared times theta dot squared plus mg uh, times l0 plus x cosine theta minus 1 half kx squared. Equation 3, and that is Lagrangian. And now we can proceed to find the equations of motion using Lagrange's equations. So turning the page, I've rewritten the Lagrangian from the previous page. This is just equation three. And now we want to put this into Lagrange's equations. Let me write Lagrange's equations for you. It's d by dt of partial L partial Q dot sub I minus partial L partial Q is equal to capital Q sub I, the generalized forces. That is equation four. And now all we need to do is substitute equation 3 into equation 4, and in each case take the derivative with respect to the associated coordinate. So first of all, the x-coordinate. I've got to take the derivative of L with respect to x dot. This is the only term that survives. I end up with an mx dot, and the time derivative of that gives me a double dot, minus... I've got to take the derivative of L with respect to X. So each of these three terms will now contribute. And that is equal to M uh, L0 plus X. The two cancels the half, theta dot squared. 
plus mg, take the derivative with respect to x, gives me a 1, cosine theta, minus kx. And that's equal to 0. And this can be written, rewritten as mx double dot minus m into L0 plus x Just going to switch around these last two terms. Cosine theta is equal to zero. And that is equation five. And then I can, I guess, make a simplification if I divide through by the mass each of the terms. This I end up with k over m, and that cancels. All right, and then we look at the theta direction or the theta coordinates. I've got to take the derivative of this with respect to theta dot. It's only the second term that survives. I end up with 2m times L0 plus x times x dot theta dot plus m times L0 plus x squared theta double dot and I get that by applying the chain rule when I apply my time derivative. So I first take the derivative with respect to theta dot, and then the derivative with respect to time, and I get those two terms, plus mg L0 plus x sine theta equals 0. We'll call this equation 6, and this is the second equation of motion. I can divide through by m. Okay, and for the purpose of eventually performing numerical integration on the equations of motion, I will rewrite them in terms of the accelerations. x double dot is equal to L0 plus x times theta dot squared minus k divided by m times x plus Oops, g cosine of theta. That's equation 7. And then theta double dot is equal to, becomes a minus 2, divided by, I'm going to divide everything by L0 plus x squared, since uh, that's what's multiplying the theta double dot. So L0 here is what survives x dot theta dot minus g x again sine of theta. Equation 8. We're done. Let's put a box around it. And there you have the two equations of motion. Now, it might be of interest to say, you know, what if we held theta and its derivatives to zero? We find that this term drops out of the first equation. Of course, all the terms drop out of the second equation. And what we're left with in the first equation is the simple harmonic oscillator with gravitational effects. That's why you've got this g cosine theta. But that's just the simple harmonic oscillator that we've seen before. Similarly, if we suppress x in its derivatives, this would go to 0, this would go to 0, this would go to 0, and this would go to 0, and this would go to 0, and this reduces now to the simple pendulum problem that we've seen before. Well, that's all I'm going to say about it in this video. I hope you found something useful in it. Please go ahead and hit those like buttons, or go ahead and subscribe to this channel if you want to be notified of updates. If you have any questions or if you found this video just mediocre or you don't feel like you got value for money, I'd like to hear from you in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.